that I've been using simulation for quite a few years, and I want to briefly go through how I see simulation in the learning spectrum, or the different modes we have. Then I'll talk a little bit about why you'd want to use a simulation, or what they are as well, and then questions you'd ask if you were going to adopt one, especially a digital type simulation. Um, I'll give you five examples, uh, just to go through briefly, especially the ones I've spent most time on. And there's a whole sheet of references at the end about using simulation in classes, so that, that's in the handout you'll get. So I think, I, I just came up with my own definition, that simulations are, are designed, or should be designed, to encourage learning with, by mimicking the real world uh, to some extent, uh, hopefully a high extent, that you can't get the real world proper. But because you can mimic it, and in a very short period of time, you can mimic a lot of different situations. This is why it's uh, particularly useful. Um, so the participants, students, depending on which part of the school you come from, are there to make decisions. So that has to be part of any simulation. It doesn't have to be a digital or computer-based simulation. Um, and it will be on a periodic basis. So typically, you would expose uh, students to different um, demand, for example, in a business environment and then they'll make different decisions uh, and see how, see how it goes. So they'll be learning as they go, and then you have a feedback session at the end. It could be team-based. Uh, most of the ones I run are in teams, and that part of the dynamic is normally the most important part. When you talk to students afterwards, they'll, they'll say, you know, I really learned how to set up things. I know Mike's bikes, which Dale has run, are very much around the, the, the function of each person, how you work together as, as a company. Um, it can be competitive. I like them to be competitive, and I normally award grades uh, for the outcome. I'll talk about that um, briefly. Um, and generally computer-assisted, but not always. In fact, a couple of the simulations I'll mention that I, I don't use computers for. And the participants have to observe the outcomes. Uh, so generally, I have a wrap-up session at the end. Sometimes it can be done right after the simulation is finished, but often it's after um, a week or, or the ne next class session. Um, Okay, so I don't think I've covered all the stuff that was, is going to be mentioned today, but I, I would see a traditional lecture, and I still do a lot of that, as one part, you know, more on the theory side of things. I, again, I bring out practice and my consulting experience and so on. Then just you know, giving questions to students, that's part of the learning process. Uh, case studies, which I use a lot, you know, you're moving more and more towards practice, multifunctional areas, strategy, and so on. Uh, doing applied projects, which you do in many of our programs and internships. So where does simulation fit? I think it kind of can be very practice oriented. So we're actually trying to get students to be in there, in the control seat, making decisions. And, but they can also be quite theory. So I, I think it has a wide, wide spectrum there. Yeah. Why would I use them? Well, um, I, I think it's just great for learning and for three reasons. One is that it, it's effective, like students come back and they say, you know, I, I really learned how to do things there, and it's very efficient. Um, you know, for five or ten dollars, typically, you can give, give a student much more than I could give them in an hour. So if you think about our cost per hour and the cost of a simulation that may do in the comfort of their own home, uh, yeah, I sometimes worry, wonder about my own value. My value is in, you know, orchestrating this <laughs> in a way that you know, you can leverage it. And I think you can actually, you could create an entire course, I would say an entire program, just on simulations. Uh, it'll be the most popular course in the university. It would be, you could charge a premium for it. And, uh, you know, if the, if the university really is interested in, in financial benefit, that would be a great thing to do. Um, students love them, they, they really do. And the group dynamics, as I mentioned earlier, is, is just terrific. Uh, I'll show you some photos in a moment. Um, the other thing you can do is a lot of these simulations are, are globally provided. And so the one I've, I'm going to mention a little bit about is run on some servers in Stanford. A couple of guys out of Stanford I decided to uh, create this package about 10 or 15 years ago. And so I, I run this in most of the courses I do, and Tava Olsen here also does that. And they have a once a year competition run out of MIT. So there's a club in MIT uh, that runs this and it's extremely competitive It now has typically a couple of hundred teams from all around the world uh, and uh, for some reason one particular university seems to do this particularly well but the prizes aren't that high like five thousand dollars it's sponsored um, a couple of years ago one of the guys one of the teams who won it was a one person team in, in Russia it's a 72 hour simulation like non-stop 
And uh, I've had teams in China and New Zealand uh, run this. And so this tells you a bit about the last one. It typically runs around April. Uh, very, very high, high pressure. And these are the, this UC San Diego has some ability in this particular way, but MIT's run it and all the top business schools around the world run this particular package and I'm going to tell you a bit about it. But the MIT competition is a particular parameter set. They run it in a different way every year. So it's a, a new way, same platform, but different parameters. I can tell you more about that. I typically give a one hour session to the students doing this before they run it. Uh, the other thing which I don't think should be minimized is the possibility of, of using these kind of platforms to do research. So I, I, for example, got a lot of data about students and you can do work on ethnicity and how that affects outcomes. And there are a lot of people, especially in the behavioral operations area, who use the classroom. Now there's some ethical questions about that. Um, but I guess more important for me is I'm also interested in getting students interested in simulation, not as a learning tool, but as a research tool. And uh, we, we have courses in the business school here around, around simulation. So what should you ask before you adopt one of these things? I, first, I think the first one is, you know, what's the objective of the course? Um, how does this fit? Is it just a tool? Is it just a playground? Um, that's not sufficient reason to use simulation. It has to fit with the learning objective. So if it's about team dynamics, about experiencing wide variety of environments, uh, about looking at multiple parameters. So typically most of our games and exercises in our classes, we just have one or two uh, levers you know, to move. But these simulations are much more complex. And you can typically provide a simple to medium to, to very high levels of complexity. Um, next one is cost. So as I mentioned, you know, some of these you buy the package. Uh, some of them, they're free, uh, but generally the ones coming out of Harvard and Ivy and other, other schools are around five to 10 US dollars uh, per student. I, honestly, I think it's worth it. And there are questions you might ask me later about you know, who pays for this, um, but it can certainly come in the course package uh, type. type. Um, time, so there's the preparation time. This is, I'm looking at from a student perspective, you know, how much time does it take them to understand what they're going to do, or do you just throw them in the deep end and get them to scream out? Are the actual participation time in the class, or is it outside the class? I'll talk about that shortly. Um, and then the, the debrief afterwards. For most of my simulations, that there would be several hours, um, you know, two to three hours. Um, is it a game? So uh, I don't know much about game theory, but do the teams, like in Mike's Bikes, uh, actually compete for market share, for example? Or do they all get the same demand? And they're actually subject to identical demand. And the only issue of competition is who does better than the other. So a more you know, realistic environment is where they're competing against each other uh, for customers and for human resources and all kinds of resources. Um, will it be graded? Um, and if so, how? So I've come to a compromise in this. Uh, Students just like us make some really bad mistakes. And a couple of years ago, there's an ice cream company just down the road on Highway 1, um, which will remain nameless, <laughs> where one person was ordering chocolate and he accidentally put in a couple of extra zeros. So about you know 55 tonnes of chocolate, I don't know how much it was, came from Switzerland and the guy was fired. But you know, he just added another zero or two zeros. And I hear this frequently, even with electronic ordering it happens. But sometimes this happens with students. They, they type in, you know, I want to buy you know, 55 machines instead of five, and they go bankrupt. You know? So you have to be a little bit flexible here. So typically what I'll do is uh, one of two things. Either I'll take the best of two or best of three, something like that, or I'll give them the option to write a report and to reflect on their learning. And actually, I've had Viva Voce you know, meetings with the students afterwards where they get questions from me about you know, what would you have done, what should you have done, and, and you know they can still get 100% in the course if they now have learned what, what they should have done. Because the whole point is actually to learn, it's not actually to get a great grade, which is normally, in this case, the final cash position or the profit being the highest. Um, unfair advantage, so I'm, I'm very concerned about equity, so uh, typically I change everything from one year to the next, I change the games I use. So you need a simulation, I think, which allows the instructor to tailor it, tailor the demand streams, tailor the random numbers that are used to, to generate demand, which is in operations typically the, the big driver. Uh, so I, I would ask that 
when before you adopt dissemination, can you change it from year to year? One of the most popular ones in operations is the beer game. Has anyone heard? I know most of you are not in operations, but there's a beer game. It's nothing to do with drinking this stuff. But this has been running for 30 years, and I'm always worried that some of the students have read um, the book by Peter Senge on this, the fifth discipline, or that they've done it, or someone else has done it, and they know what, what actually you should do. But it turns out that even people who know have seen the, the game and the demand stream still can't do very well. And what I normally do is I put all those students in one group who've done it before, and there aren't very many of them, and they often don't outperform the others. Um, do they need to be in the same room? So this, this is a big uh, struggle. It's, it's quite interesting. So some of the games I'll show you the photos of in a moment, uh, I'd like it to be in a big room with a lot of buzz going on and there's uh, yelling out when certain things happen. It's just a much greater learning experience. But on the, on the downside, you get kind of industrial espionage. So the group, groups are kind of this thing and they're seeing and... and um, so some of these games, most of them actually can be run anywhere, so you can have multiple members of the same team in anywhere in the world running them, and I, I've run it that way too. Um, should you do a trial run, I've gradually come to the view that this should be done like just for five minutes so the students know how to change numbers and make, make these decisions so that they don't feel totally, you know, total discomfort when they first come across the simulation. Um, and rewards. I, I typically give out a box of chocolates or so to the, to the leading team. Um, are they in lockstep? So if you're, for example, if you have demand streams that are coming to the students, uh, should you wait until everyone's finished that particular round and then go on to the next one? That typically works better. But the, the faster teams are sitting there twiddling their thumbs. And I know we have this in the TBL environments. But, but it is a question. Um, on customization, I would ask, is your simulation, are you able to make it simple or complex? So one of the, the ones that has the MIT competition for the same kind of platform, you can make it very simple and sometimes they'll run it twice where they just have a single decision to make. You run it for a couple of hours, they become familiar with the environment and then a few uh, weeks later you'll give them the full blown one and they're, they're now, you know, you're expanding their, their horizons a bit. So level of complexity. Uh, second one is the parameters and parameter levels. Can you change them? And I would argue that you, you really do want to be able to do this. But the, the last one is a fascinating one. I know Tava and I have talked a bit about this. So that the game that I played, I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, you can run it over weeks or hours. And I, I've run it in both situations. I've, I've done it in three days. Like this MIT competition does it in 72 hours. That would be ridiculous uh, for most students. So I'm thinking about the students. Are they working, for example? And might they miss an opportunity to make a great decision while they're at a meeting, you know, if they're executives? Or there are students who are in a, in a class and you don't want them to be in, in anyone's class and you're sitting at the back of the room not trading stocks but running by simulation. So for all of those reasons, I've pretty well gone now to it's in class, it's two hours, it's very, very compressed and it's very pressured and I kind of, kind of like that environment. So I, I've moved to a two-hour kind of thing for this. Um, now, if you are computer assisted, there are more questions you'd want to ask. One is, you know, can you have multiple logins? Uh, and you've got to watch that you don't have too many cooks spoiling the broth. Like you've got five people doing procurement in the team and they're all making the same decision or over-ordering. Um, platforms like, can you do it on mobile, Apple, what kind of browsers you can use. Uh, bandwidth, I had a disaster uh, last year at, in Beijing when I was running it, when the just bandwidth was absolutely zero because it was going across the Pacific to, to California, and students were waiting a minute, you know, for their for their um, for their input to be actually registered. And I had some very unhappy students, and I got very bad evaluation for that course. So you got to make sure the bandwidth is good, and here as well. Like, can you run you know 50 simultaneous logins in, in, in a room? And customizing the random number seed, I change this every time normally so you don't get the same demand as previous times. And is there a control panel? Most of these do have one, so I can wander around, walk into a room, because often students are in a breakout room, and I'll know what's, what they've done wrong, and I'll sit there and I, you know, it's, it's part of the control freak, part of my personality. You, you like to know what's happened, and you can tell them what's happened. So this is really bad color, but. These are just a list that's in your handout of the 
simulations that I've used and others. I'm going to talk briefly about the bolded ones. Um, so Mike's Bikes is a general business one that Dal could tell you lots about. Um, what should I say about this? I think I just want to mention this, this last one. So I don't want this to be just an operations only thing. Uh, most of these are around supply chain, operations management. But ha at Harvard, you can go and look at the website, and they've got stuff from other schools that are there in almost every discipline, entrepreneurship, strategy, accounting, finance, everything. Um, so these are freely available. Has anyone used uh, some of these tools from Harvard? Um, no, just an observation uh, there with how much they're pushing it or, or how mainstream Yeah. I think you know, it, it's expected in many programs now, uh, and it's not the real world. So you know, I think the best thing to do is get students into the real world. But this is, the, I think, the next best thing. Uh, maybe an internship. Um, so these, are, a lot of them are around uh, operations decisions, procurement, and quality. And how much you make and buy, and those staffing decisions and so on. So I'm just going to look briefly at Littlefield, eBear, and a couple of these other ones in the remaining time. Um, so this is Littlefield Technologies. Uh, so it's a very simple, it's a factory, and you've got several machines, and you have to decide, these are the decisions you have to make, I'll show you here. You basically click on the different icons to input your decisions. And the decisions about how many machines should you have, how much should you buy, how you should prioritize the flow through this. And this is the basis of the MIT competition. The platform's a little bit dated uh, now, um, but it's um, very, very popular. I, I've never, apart from that bandwidth problem, never had a problem with this. You know, classes here, this is just next, next door. You know, they actually go into the room and they, they book a room out and they've, they've done all this stuff beforehand. Uh, this is a couple of guys at INSEAD uh, last year. So they, they're not just games, you know, they, people actually take these quite seriously. These are my students from last, um, last semester here. And the top students, and I, I just announced these afterwards, number three, number two, and number one, and give them out some, some chocolate. So <laughs> these, you know, you can go around and actually see what, what's going on. And, uh, um, and then I show them a little bit about, you know, what should you have done. So before the game even starts, you can log in and you can see the first 30 days. And basically in a simulation, you're compressing time. So this is a one year, running a factory for one year, and you can do it in two hours. So you know, every every minute is is a couple of three days. It's a very um, very time intensive. So I, I say this is what you could have seen at the start, and the good groups have done that. You can do a regression on the demand. Um, you can look at the utilization um, of the machines and see that you've got a bottleneck coming up. Like there's a machine that's about to need some more capacity, um, and you can actually work out the capacity of each of the machines. Which many students can't do this, but after a while they, they actually get to feel it by seeing, oh, there's something wrong here, this machine's got a big queue in front of it. And so actually seeing that is actually far better than me telling them, go and work out how many jobs it's receiving and how many it's putting out. Or it's just feeling it, actually seeing there, and having a group member screaming at you because there's nothing coming out, <laughs> or you don't have the inventory to make anything. So that, that is worth much more than any equation. Um, but you have to do the numbers. Um, and then I go through the winning team and explain what they did and what their performance was. It's just, this is a, it's just a wonderful game. Uh, so we pay for that. You, you pay cheaper if you're in a developing country, but it's around $15 US for, for two simulations. So the little field is one of them, and uh, you can match it with eBear, which is a beer game in an electronic format. Um, so basically the beer game, as I mentioned, it has four levels, so you're brewing beer, it takes time to get from the manufacturer to the distributor all the way down to those thirsty customers. Um, but you also have to make the orders, and that's going from the right to the left. Um, so this is a very classic, uh, the, the key operation simulation that's been used for years. Uh, I, I've done it uh, for many years. I did it physically. And the problem there is it takes a lot of effort to lay out and then you get students losing things on the floor. Someone gives you a six and you think it's a nine. And actually I quite like that because that's, that's the real world, but it, is, it has a lot of um, overhead. And rather, and that takes like about three hours. 
it's much easier to run it over an hour and a half or something like that uh, digitally. So there, I, you know, it's, I think it's worth paying ten dollars to do that. Um, this is uh, a game I've just run uh, for the first time uh, last quarter, and it's uh, out of a couple of guys at Northwestern who've done this, and. Uh, you're basically sourcing from two different parts of the world. One is cheap and long time to get it, and the other one's uh, shorter and more expensive. And the students have to work out how to allocate their decisions or their procurement amongst these two. So this is uh, downstairs in the... Give me a good presentation of the video. Um, so these students, you can just see they're very... They're very intent on Mosh Tabo, who's at the back here, was uh, running this with me. You don't need too many people to walk around the classroom. Like that. Normally I'd have a TA in the room if you had more than you know, maybe 15 or 20 people. So I like that game. Uh, and again, you do kick off, you do pre-work for the students to know what, what kind of decisions they're going to have to make. But you're not giving them typically a lot of the, the exact theory. They've got stuff that they can work on. And because it's more real-worldish, you can say, now the theory kind of breaks down here, how would, how would you adjust it? So again, I'm pushing them more towards real world. Um, that's the, the screen that you get when, when you log in here. And last two, have five minutes of questions. Um, the poster game I've been running for a while, I got some research out of it pub published in this. And this is a very a simple um, thing. Again, sorry about the color. So I, I just give them three different posters. And uh, so does anyone know what the left hand one is? Haven't credited Craig Potton with it, but it's uh, Milford Sound. It's a waterfall. Did you know what the middle one is? The colour's terrible. It's Monet, right? So Lily's. It's not upside down. I promise. And Tigger. <laughs> so you give them three, and then you ask them which one would they like to select for themselves. So I, I get that information, and then I've done this using clicker technology downstairs. Um, normally, I just bring the data in, and then I'll, I'll input it on my laptop during a, a morning tea. And then afterwards, I'll give it back. So wh why am I wanting to do this? Well, after this, I then tell them uh, they're now in an environment where they have to decide how many they're going to buy of these three different posters. Mm -hmm. And after the game or the Easter show or whatever they're at, those, those posters are not worth anything. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they should be thinking at that point, how much is it going to cost if they have too many of them? Because there's a margin on these things. And, or how much do they lose if they don't have enough? So this is a class that we're called a newsboy or news vendor problem. And so when I, I've been playing this game for years. I've got all this data, like just from all different cultures and so on. You know, which ones do they buy themselves? And male, female, Chinese, Caucasian, different. You can look at that. But what's more interesting is how much they buy. So how many buy more than the? So the total class. That's the population. So they know there's 35 people. Um, they don't know whether it's going to be 12, 12, 11, or 35, 0, 0. They've got to identify that. So you look at how many people buy more than the total, which is actually what they should do, uh, if the, the cost of being out is very high. Um, how many, this is a very interesting one, how many buy more of the one that they themselves didn't order? So this actually is a, is a sign of someone who's good at forecasting. So if you, if you pick number two, because you like it, and then you go ahead and you order more of the Tigger. That shows you, you understand a bit more about the customers. It's not a foolproof, I think. Um, so we, I've got just so much data on this I, I put in, and so I discovered, I actually learned from this, that I actually wasn't testing how good they were at inventory management. I was testing how good they are at forecasting, because if you get it right, like let's say it's 12, 12, 12, and you get it exactly right, you, you, you maximize your profit. So in a class of 60, you'll get someone who gets pretty close. So from that, I, st I kept thinking, there's something not right here. I, I, I want this to test forecasting capability. When you look around the room, you say, oh, there's some mothers there who probably want to buy tickets for their children, and there's some romantics here, and there's some, <laughs> um, there's some hikers in New Zealand. People want to fly to New Zealand to buy the other one. People actually do that. You watch them. They look around the classroom. So th this is simulating a buying environment. And so what I realized is I wasn't testing how good you are at inventory. And the only way to do that was to run a simulation multiple periods. But I didn't have time to do this. So actually, this is the research that came out of this. We actually set up a system where we ran simulations using those same 
probabilities of buying each of those products and then worked out who would be the best you know, in the long term based on that strategy. So you can luck out and get the exact demand, but it won't be that the next time, even if it's the same expected values. And so sometimes when I give out a price here, I'll give out a price to the person who got the highest profit from the class, and then I'll show them, because on the spreadsheet I've worked this out, in the long run what would be the best one. Sometimes it's the same person, but often it's someone quite different. Typically someone who's bought more than the total sum. But most people, they don't even think about the numbers. So I always ask the question, because most people just order exactly the total of the people in the classroom, and I'll say, so what if instead of being a $10 revenue for selling these things, it was like $1,000? You pay $2, you get $1,000. Would you have bought more? And then everyone says, uh, yeah, yes, we would have. And so you actually extract this from them, and the experience helps a lot. Um, last one is a very a simple game. Uh, maybe you've seen it. So most of you are familiar with prisoners' dilemmas. If you anyone know a prisoners' dilemma. So in the context of supply chain, I think the most important concept in supply chain is trust. So how do you how do you push this out in the class? So what I do is I have um, the colours back. I have a uh, posters. Uh, sorry, uh, not posters. These red and green cards which students can hold up. So I typically pick five volunteers in a class, I spread them out so that they're, you know, different angles. And by the way, I often never go to the right of the class. This is when peer evaluation comes, they say, you never look at the right side of the class, I'll say every while. <laughs> um, so here, the students, I get to put up one poster, either green or red, and you can have a team if you want. And so there is a different payoff. So if all the colours are green, if all the cards are green, you get one point each. If they're all red, you all lose two points. And if there's a mixture, the green gets one and the red cards lose three. So you give them about a minute or so to figure out what they're going to do. And then you go one, two, three, hold up your cards. And it's amazing. Again, culturally, there are different things going on. And you do this several times. Uh, and then after a while, uh, you, if you have time, you, you send the group, the, the whole four out you know, they go outside and they can collude. So prior to that, there's been no collusion, no cooperation. And th this always works well. Everyone comes up and says, you know, how, how would you maximise the profit? You would agree to, like the, the birds flying, I don't know what they are, the canid geese or something, you know, they, they fly in formation and they, like the cyclist, the guy in the front, you know, goes to the back and someone comes up and takes their place. And so they, everyone almost gets this. And... So they come back in the room and one person will hold up a red and take... Sorry, which way is it? Yeah, one person will hold up a green and take the hit. Everyone else will get the benefit. And then the next round, because you've played many rounds. So these are, these are really simulations. They're games which go through multiple periods, making decisions, and where students are experiencing the impact of their decisions. And it could be... Financial could be their grade. You know, there's some cost to it uh, to them or some benefit from it. So this is a, I create spreadsheets for most of these, so I'm just sitting there typing in. So the G's there, A, B, C, D is five teams. Round one, I just I've done it, so I don't have to put red and green. This whenever I see a green, I just go G G. So you, you have to make it fast. You, you don't want to make this um, over, overkill for the students. So there's a lot more on these 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 articles, uh, in, and they're not just related to operations, but they're you know, how do you use simulations in classes? Why would you want to use them a bit more detail than, than I've given? But, you know, if I could, I'd love to run a whole course using these. And um, executive education, big, big area for them. Uh, but undergraduates love them. I know Dale's had really good experience with Mike's bikes. And I'm happy to take questions. I think I have one minute. Yeah, I really love the uh, the three poster game that you've got. Are they allowed to do? Because I'm I'm from marketing. Are they allowed to? Do you ever have a situation where you allow them to actually market uh, and create increased demand for a certain poster or all three posters, or do market research and talk to the class to figure out? Yeah, so that would be the next step. So the question is, you know, so that's just teaching. Actually, it's teaching two things: forecasting and inventory. If you want to go on and make it price dependent or market dependent, make it more Mike Spikes ish. Yeah, you, you can do that. So that, I guess the question from an instructor point of view is how many things can you deliver at the same? So I'd probably do it in two steps. Like the first one, 
just do it simple, get one thing out of it, and then, then build it. Otherwise, you, you can c confound the, the learning, I think. You mentioned um, the ethical issue of using this data. Right. Um, do you plan to publish this? Because this is really exciting stuff. Uh, well, actually, I thought I'd put it up there. But So the one on the, the poster game is, is published. Is it not there? Disappeared off it. That is um, That's great. Yeah, but it, there's no people. It's just there's the probabilities that are, that are mentioned. Yeah. We pub uh, well only at the thesis level, but there was a master's thesis done on our one of our Mike's bike simulations, oh, yeah, cool. so you can get permission and ethic approval for it. Yeah. So I want to say a quick question because I don't have to stop. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to talk just very briefly about. Um, My effort, oh, the first one's always the longest. Uh, but after that, it's, it's very, very minimal. It's, you know, once you've done it once, it's almost nothing, especially if you go digital. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks. <laughs>